So we've been doing electron configuration, and if you need any help with that, see my video on electron configuration. But I just want to go a little bit more in depth as to what some of these numbers and letters mean. So as you notice, we're always kind of putting numbers in front of each of these sets, which we said corresponds to, if we're using the periodic table to help us, corresponds to what row it's in. But what that actually means is the shell or energy level that that subshell and those electrons are located in. And as you saw on the color periodic table I had you use, you might see these N equals. A lot of the times we give um, as a shortcut or an abbreviation, we write N to stand for the energy level or the, or the energy, sh the electron shell. Um, and we call this the principal quantum number. And if you get into quantum numbers, which is a little bit beyond what the AP does, um, there's other quantum numbers, but this particular one is called the, quantum, the principal quantum number. And remember, the higher the N, the further you are from the nucleus, the less tightly bound that electron is, and the easier it will be to re be removed because you're not feeling as much of the force of those protons pulling it in as you would if you were closer. Um, and any collection of orbitals with the same value of n is called an electron shell. So anytime you see a 3 in front, that corresponds to the third shell. Um, with a, and it's 3, that's your principal quantum number. Recall from orbital notation that anytime we hit an s, we would draw one box because we said s holds only one orbital. Anytime we would hit a p, we would draw, draw three boxes because p held three orbitals, d5 and f7. Um, so even though in orbital notation we're drawing these as boxes, they are not actually box shaped. If you remember, an orbital is a likely location of finding an electron. And we give them these different letters because each of these different letters actually has a different shape to them as well. Um, so if you're looking at an S, which only has one orbital, that S orbital is a spherical shape. Um, and that's something that you should know. So the electrons are moving so quickly, so quickly in here, whether it's one or two max, but the electron is are moving so quickly that they create almost a blur or a cloud that is spherical in shape. In the p orbitals, the electron or electrons, depending if you have one or two, um, are moving so quickly that they create an, an ellipsoid kind of figure, um, kind of almost looks like a figure eight where you basically have zero probability of finding it at the nucleus, but it creates these kind of balloon shapes here. And notice that there are three different orientations for P because as you remember, P has three boxes, three different orbitals, and each of those orbitals is in a different orientation. So one is along the x-axis, one is along the y-axis, and one is along the z-axis. So all together, those three p orbitals would look something like this crazy kind of balloon looking thing where here where's one of the orbitals in x one of the orbitals in y and one of them in z together um so you should know those different shapes you should know that s has one p has three and that um s is spherical and p is this dumb some people call it a dumbbell shape ellipsoid pattern however you want to call that um, and technically these orientations if you go into quantum numbers are described by the magnetic quantum number um, but that's a little bit beyond what we're doing in ap chemistry um, you don't really need to know the shapes for D and F, but it makes sense that D has five different orientations for each of the five D orbitals, and F would have seven. Um, so again, you don't really need to know those shapes, but you should know that there is as many orientations as there are orbitals for that particular sublevel. And if you remember when we were doing our orbital notation, we said that we would always put a max of two electrons. And if we did put a max of two electrons, we would put one up and one down arrow showing that they have opposite spins. Um, and that was like the Pauli exclusion principle, right? So here, just knowing that the maximum number of electrons, which corresponds to when we're doing our electron configuration, this is why anytime we hit an S, we put a max of two there two boxes in the S subshell before moving on to P, right? One, two, three, four, five, six in the P. That's why you saw P, you know, six is max exponent for P. D, max of 10. F, max of 14. And that's just something you should know rather than having to count the boxes each time. If you're passing through an S and it's filled, it's two. You're passing through a P, it's six. Passing through a G, it's 10. Passing through an F, it's 14. No matter what. Okay. Um, and... 
each energy level, so as you get further and further from the nucleus, it makes sense that the diameter of that space is getting bigger. If you're thinking of the energy level like a ring, um, you know, the diameter of that ring is getting bigger and bigger, so more subshells are able to fit in that area. So as each, each energy level actually contains as many subshells as the shell number. The first shell only has one subshell, so it only has S, which we said could hold a max of two electrons. Two, the second shell, if we go back here, the, the things we hit in the second shell is 2s and 2p, so it only has two. If we're going to the third shell, 3s, 3p, and then don't forget, even though we fill 4s first, there is still 3d. So the third shell holds s, p, and d. It holds three subshells. And the fourth shell holds 4s, 4p, further, you know, a little further down we have the 4d. And then don't forget in this sixth row, after filling 6s, we go and fill 4f. So the fourth shell actually has 4s, 4p, 4d, and 4f. So those are four subshells. So notice they have as many subshells as there are shells. Then once you get beyond four into five, could there technically be a fifth subshell? Um, maybe, but we haven't discovered enough elements to have a need to go back and fill five whatever that might be. So we've only discovered up to F. Um, so four subshells is the max really that we've seen so far. And electrons in the same subshell all have the same energy and that word, you know, a word for that is saying degenerate. So the 2P, you know, even though we draw th three boxes for P in the orbital notation or we've seen those three different um, orbital orientations for P, they all have the same energy. Um, so technically, if you remove one of the electrons from any of those P orbitals, it would, um, it would require the same energy. There's something called penetration effect, and it's that the outer energy levels penetrate through the inner levels toward the nucleus. So remember that our electrons are constantly moving. So they don't stay in any one place all the time. Even our inner sh or outer shells eventually, you know, get the electrons can get closer to the nucleus and then move back out. Um, the most penetration to the least penetration in order is S has the most, followed by P, followed by D, followed by F within the same subshell. So 4S, let's say we're talking about the fourth subshell, 4S can get a little closer to the nucleus, um, can penetrate the nucleus better than 4P, then 4D, and then 4F. And that's why this is the order that these subshells are filled. S is always filled first, then P, then D, then F for any, for any shell. Um, and just kind of a viewing of this, so here's 1s, right, and it looks on average to be closer to the nucleus than the 2s and 2p subshells, which makes sense because the first shell is closer than the second shell. But if we look at this plot of density versus nucleus for the s and p, so this red one here is s, notice at really small distances, meaning very close to the nucleus, there's a higher probability of that electron from S being able to get a little closer to the nucleus. So we say that S penetrates the nucleus better and that's why it's filled before P and then P before, you know, D and D before F. Um, the D and F orbitals actually have a much more restrictive path and don't penetrate the nucleus as well. They take a lot more energy to fill, which is why we fill 4S before filling uh, 3D. Um, so here showing 4s can actually get closer to the nucleus um, than 3d can when we're talking about very short distances. Um, another way um, that I like to view this is why does 4s get filled before 3d? Because if I'm trying to put electrons in 3d, notice that I'm putting it in an area where there's already a lot of electrons. And what do electrons do with each other? They repel each other. So it makes sense that it's more likely to fill 4s, which on average is going to be further out from the nucleus most of the time, but can penetrate the nucleus better at times um, than going in and putting electrons in a place where there's already a lot of electrons and would repel each other. Um, and how do orbitals differ? So let's say you're talking here about neon versus helium and we're talking about the 1s orbital and obviously any has more orbitals beyond 1s. But if we're talking about the 1s orbital in neon and helium, they would both be spherical in shape because anytime you hit s, it would be spherical in shape. And they both might hold two electrons in it. However, neon has 10 protons in the nucleus versus helium only having four. 
So those 10 protons in the nucleus are going to attract the 1s electrons much more than the four protons in the helium nucleus. And we will go into this in more depth when talking about Coulombic forces of attraction and things like effective nuclear charge. Feel free to watch my video on that. Um, but even though they're both spherical in shape, the 1s in neon is going to be smaller size because it has more protons pulling it in. So it is the same shape, spherical, but smaller due to the stronger nuclear charge holding these, those electrons closer and tighter to, toward that nucleus. And this is actually why even things with the same number of electrons, like things that are isoelectronic, like ions, like neon and any, Na+, plus, even though they would have the same number of electrons, they have different protons pulling in those electrons so your energy level spacings and the shapes of these orbitals or you know size I should say of these orbitals is going to be different. The fourth quantum number describes the spin and all you really need to know about this is that again each orbital contains two electrons and they have to have opposite spins. So if one's spinning clockwise the other has to spin counterclockwise and in our orbital notation or orbital diagrams or Aufbau diagrams we show that by drawing one arrow up and one arrow down. And again, this is the Pauli exclusion principle. And just as a heads up, this is beyond the AP. You used to have to know some of these irregularities, but they took it off the exam. Um, a lot of the, in the D and F orbitals, um, there's a lot of irregularities that happen that do kind of break that order of filling um, the electrons in the order that we would predict. Um, so for instance, copper, we would expect it to be 4s2, 3d9, but in actuality, one of the electrons from s jumps into the 3d, um, and you get 4s1, 3d10. This is not excited state. This is just the ground state for copper. This happens a lot of the time when the d electrons are almost filled. Um, it tends to be more stable to have a filled d rather than a almost filled D. So it happens in this like D9 category, um, you know, where it jumps, one of the electrons from S actually jumps and turns it into D10. And it actually happens when it's almost half filled too. Um, so it, it happens, um, I show in the D4 category where you would normally get like 4S2, D, 4S2, 3D4, it ends up being 4S1, 3D5. Nothing that you need to know if you were on the AP exam or one of my exams and you wrote, you know, th uh, 4s2, 3d4 for one of them, I would definitely give it. So you don't have to know any of these exceptions. But if you were ever to look up some of these valence electrons, how many valence electrons does, you know, copper have, it might say one instead of two. And you might wonder, well, why is that? It's because some of these anomalies happen not and you're not responsible. This also happens in the F subshell. If there's one in F, it actually goes back and fills the D instead. There's another anomaly that, um, so instead of 4F1, it actually goes 5D1, then fills the rest of F. So it's there's a, a bunch of anomalies that happen. It happens in the F8 as well. Um, so not that you have to be aware of, I just wanted to draw your attention to this in case you ever were trying to check your work and look up the electron configuration of some of these things, you might get a different answer than you predict. Um, so these anomalies exist, you do not need to know them for the AP exam. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Some of the main takeaways is knowing the shapes of the S. S is spherical, that's knowing the shape of P. P is actually this dumbbell shaped, and there are three different orientations for P because there are three different orbitals. And those orbitals are degenerate, meaning they have the same energy, but they just travel in different orientations.